to, um, you know, to, to become, to, to reduce the amount of time they have to spend in college ESL classes, um, or perhaps go directly into um, freshman composition, but more generally we're preparing them for college overall. So I think what I wanted to start with was, I was just gonna talk about, you know, the purpose and characteristics of college writing assignments and the different forms. I was gonna show some examples of those types of assignments, um, which I've collected. And then I wanted to show some samples of our curricula activities that, that do that to prepare students for, for that type of writing. So, but I just wanted to start out by asking when, when writing assignments are given in your classes for, for your students, what's, what's the purpose of those writing assignments? Why are you, know, why are you giving those assignments? What, what's the, uh, the objective for them? Because we want to sort of compare and contrast how, how that's similar or different from college writing assignments. Oh, yeah. um, um, in my, my, sorry, go ahead. Hey, Monica, go ahead. Monica, why don't you start? Yeah. Okay. My aim is, of course, to develop their skills in writing. Right. Okay. So basically, the first thing I, I tend to ask the write about is yourself. Tell me about a little bit of yourself. Right. Like, uh, yeah, your dreams and your ambitions, and you know what you want out of the course and so on. And then I begin to, uh, after that, I begin to teach um, description, you know, narrative writing, and then I move on to informative and persuasive and so on. Okay. But I want them to get, I want to teach them first to write, well, Discuss sure. about yourself and so on, and then to, be able, I know about. Yeah. then to be able to get the forms of writing, different Got forms it. of writing, to be able to distinguish between the different forms of writing. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes total sense. Um, I think people's names. David. Um, David? Mm -hmm. Yes, right here. Okay. Um, they, my students, they struggle with structure, I mean, a lot. So mm -hmm. I deal with a lot of grammar skills mm -hmm. that I, I kind of flush out of their first um, drafts that okay. they give me. And I deal with that. Then I move on to paragraphing and then essay writing. Okay, great. Um, anyone else want to add something? That, that hasn't been said? Okay, well that, yeah, I mean, you're developing their skills. And so a lot of it has to do with having them sometimes write about something more that they know about so that then there's not such a struggle, right? To, to turn it into, the, into a form that you're trying to teach them. So let me share my screen now. It's really quite different in college writing. <laughs> it's actually like a very different purpose why writing is assigned. So that's important to know so that you kind of, your students know when they get to college after they've learned to write and you've taught them, it's gonna be a very different purpose. Because the purpose of college writing assignments in most classes is really to assess the student. Okay, mm -hmm. most of the writing they'll be doing after freshman comp is gonna be often, um, you know, even just short answer questions on finals or midterms in their content classes, they may have a research paper. The point there is not really to develop their skills. I mean, the point is that the instructor wants to see, do you understand the topic, right? I'm assessing it. Can you identify the concepts and apply them? And I'll show you some examples. Can you evaluate an argument and give evidence? And can you integrate sources, right? They're in a content class, they're learning about content. So the instructor is really interested in how well they understand the content. You know, of course, if they don't, if they have trouble writing, that's gonna be a barrier to that. But the instructor's not really focused 
so much on their writing skills and sometimes not even so much on grammar, depending on the instructor, because grammar will be very important when you get a job, when you write emails, all that. It's, don't tell your students, it's extremely important. You're gonna be judged, you know, evaluated that way. But you know, these the content professors are really, do you get my content? You know, that's, that's what they're most interested in. Now in freshman composition, there is still a thing about still developing and assessing these reading, thinking, research and writing skills. So that it continues. However, even in those classes, they're usually theme-based and there's usually a, a topic that, that the instructor wants to make sure that they're understanding. It might be multilingualism, it might be inequality, right? But so they're, the teacher is asking them to develop, they're developing their skills, but they need to also demonstrate they understand the content, okay? Mm -hmm. So what are the characteristics of this writing? They're always about text or topic studied in a class. Maybe there'll be one assignment in freshman comp where you write about yourself, but otherwise after that, every single thing you're gonna write about is gonna be about content. It's gonna be about a text you're reading or about a topic because again, the, the instructor is trying to see, use writing as a way for students to learn about the topic. People yeah. do that writing for learn, but also to assess whether they've really learned it. Yeah. So what's, what's really an important, like, uh, I guess, consequence of that or is there are no writing assignments that don't require academic reading skills. There, there's nothing that you're going to write <laughs> where you don't need to also be able to read. So that whole, I would say that one thing that's important is to really, as your students get to a higher level, to really prepare them to understand a text and be able to then incorporate that into their writing because that's really what they're going to be doing as they move forward. Mm. They're not really going to be writing about themselves. That, that's a good place to start to develop structure from them. But eventually for college, they're going to need, need to do that. So the things they do is they summarize. Mm -hmm. They sometimes identify and explain a factor or consequences, like what were the causes of the Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. Apply a concept or theory. So it might be... Um, because I've looked at these because we did a project on looking at assessment in college and so I looked at these exams that sometimes people don't think about writing in exams but th but there's a lot of that short writing it might be like okay this is happening how would a functionalist you know perspective explain this right comparing and contrasting different perspectives assessing an argument so it might be like um you you read something that you've read and it's making an argument that um we'll see ahead that the United States and, um, and, and the Soviet Union were in a cold war, which means like we didn't really have like any deaths. And then, so good look through the evidence, is that valid or not valid, right? So assessing an argument and its evidence and then answering a research question. So I think another difference is they're not really asking for your opinion about something. Okay, in the world, like is something good or bad or is that, it's, it's really looking at somebody else's argument and saying, is this argument solid or not solid, right? So again, it's always in relationship to a text. So I talked about um, that there's sort of two types. Some are, students have to do some timed writing actually. So it is good for them. To, that one good thing about the test prep is it teaches them how to write something within a limited time frame because they need to do that. It's really common in content classes, these short answer questions. That's why it's also really important to learn to write paragraphs because it's different than an essay and you got to really condense all your information and they're going to have to do that in all their classes. Not, not all, but many of, many of their content classes. The longer assignments have a lot of different forms. Um, and I saw a presentation at TESOL about this by someone who studies this. There's this word essay or research paper. It really doesn't mean anything specific, actually, once you get outside of English. It's like someone will say, do a research paper, and it might just be like, you know, talk about, it might be like, describe Vietnamese culture, 10 pages, you know? It's like, and then others might be really specific about what to do. And sometimes it's not one form, we'll see. It might not be a cause effect essay. It might ask them to answer two or three different questions in one essay. So it's just important that students realize that we're learning these different forms, but when you get to college, you might have to combine them.
Okay, so let's take some examples now of these assignments. This is from um, an introduction to sociology final. And so they have to write this paragraph. How do you think Tanya's ascribed status can affect her achieved status? In one example, using one ascribed and one achieved status together. So ascribed status just means something that you can't change, that you're born with. Like you're foreign born, you're a certain age, you can't change that. Achieve status is something that you, you change in the world. You become a college student, you become a lawyer, right? So this is, this is from a real um, final. And it's basically sort of looking at how, how fact, different factors affect something, right? How does the, the, the situation you were born in or what you are, how does that affect what you're able to achieve in a country? So that's like a typical question of looking at how something affects something else. It's like cause effect. Um, okay, now we're gonna look at a really one that's much more complicated. This is from a real, um, they're all real, essay um, from a um, history class. And as you can see, it's like, there is no like one structure here. This is like, you know, multiple things you're supposed to do. So, um, so the student has to really look at a question and think about what form makes sense to use to answer that question, right? And it's not really going to be an essay. She calls it an essay, but it's not really an exactly an essay. It's like a mix of different questions and answers. Um, so again, you see some things about causes. You see compare contrast with the ideological differences. Mm -hmm. You see, and here's what's really interesting. Um, in conclusion, is Cold War an appropriate or accurate name for the situation, right? So this is how they give opinions. They don't give opinions about, you know, because we do this persuasive essay, which teaches them a form, but like, they're not going to persuade them, like, should we, you know, I don't know, open up because of COVID or not. Nobody's going to like give an assignment like that. You're going to read something and then you're gonna say like, is this, what do you think about this argument or whose argument is stronger, right? So that's the kind of opinion that you give in college essays. Okay, so here's one from freshman composition. Those are probably even more challenging because in the content classes, it's pretty clear, like they're asking you something to find out if you know something in a particular discipline. And the discipline has a structure, like it has certain terminology that you need to learn or certain theories you need to learn. In freshman composition, often it's not particularly a particular discipline. So, and sometimes the assignments are really difficult, really to understand exactly what's being asked for. Okay, so here's an example of one from freshman composition. You know, it's like a barrage of questions. Like, how do you define a dangerous idea? This is from Steven Pinker. Who is it dangerous for? Are all dangerous ideas bad? Are all dangerous ideas good? You know, it's asking for a lot of things and the students got to kind of, actually one skill that I think we can develop is how do you ask your instructor, like, what do you really want me to do? You know, mm -hmm. without being rude. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's often, the people who write these, Sometimes they're graduate students who are teaching these classes. And so they're like interested in these ideas and stuff, but they're not always like that <laughs> cognizant of like how to put it in a way that would be clear for a student. Okay. Mm -hmm. But one thing that then is also important is the kind of stuff that they have to read. So I'm going to give you a new share. I'm just going to show you the sample from Steven Pinker's, you know, this is the kind of stuff they're reading in freshman comp. So he says, like, by dangerous ideas, I don't have in mind harmful technologies like those behind weapons of mass destruction or even ideologies like racist, fascist, or other fanatical cults. I have in mind statements or facts of policy that are defended with evidence and arguments by serious scientists and thinkers, but which are felt to challenge the collective decency of an age. The ideas listed above and the moral panic that each one of them has incited during the past quarter centuries are examples. Okay, so it's like, the, la the length of the sentences is long. The 
there's, there's a lot of references to things they may not know about because it's not a content class where you're learning it, right? So I think the skill is to, to look at a text like this and really ask, like, what is his fine? Don't try to understand every word here. The goal here, your goal is to figure out what his argument is, okay? is not to understand every word or look up everything. So we really try to train students in CLIP. We give them things like this and say, where's this, like, go look for a question and just find the answer. Don't, if you don't know one example, don't worry about it because you don't need to know all the examples, right? You don't need to know every example of a dangerous idea. So that just kind of shows you the reading that they, they encounter in freshman composition. Um, so in terms of how we prepare students for, oh, sorry, I need to change my share. Um, what CLIP does that is kind of unique is and which CUNY START does as well, we, we have a, a sustained interdisciplinary content-based instruction. So what does that mean? It means we study one topic the whole semester. So I'll show you an example. There's one curriculum that's about education and learning. So we're developing the writing skills, we're developing the grammar skills and listening and speaking skills, but it's within the context of studying one topic the whole semester because we wanna mimic that what happens in college where you get really deep into one topic, right? And so we're developing all those different skills, listening and speaking. And then we're basically what we're doing is in the highest level classes, we're giving them the kind of stuff they would do in freshman comp or content classes, but we're like massively scaffolding it and we're like leading them through the whole thing. So rather than just giving them the assignment, they've already done a lot of the tasks for the writing assignments as they're going through the reading. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions here? Okay, so yes. Uh, do you, so do you spend um, a session on summarizing and then another session on um, I, yeah, I, no, I mean, it's structured, I guess. Yeah, well, it, it's usually structured from like simpler to more complex, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we probably would start summarizing is not always the easiest, actually, but for the highest level, yeah, they would start with summarizing, say, two different authors, right? Then they might compare and contrast them. So mm -hmm. we try to build up from what they're doing because eventually we want them to write something kind of complicated, but we mm -hmm. want to make use of what they've already done earlier so that's how it's structured mm -hmm. what's really important is though that when we summarize we're like you got to understand the content that's that's sometimes i in my professional development i've had to push that with teachers it's like i don't care that their sentence is written correctly this is not correct what they wrote you know so it's like when you go to college it's like it doesn't matter that you wrote it nicely if it's not correct it's not correct right so really emphasizing the content and making sure that they understand that the content is, is 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 understood correctly um so let me just show you now some examples my word document Okay, so this is a new curriculum that we developed on education and learning. And um, it's interdisciplinary in the sense that the, see CLIP is 25 hours a week, I should say that, okay, for 14 weeks. So there's a lot of time to do things. This would be impossible to do in, in most classes. So that's a benefit of CLIP. That's why they get really prepared. So it's interdisciplinary because the first part is about, um, I mean, they read a novel that talks about someone who moves to America and goes to a, to a private school. Then we read selections from this book by Jonathan Kozel, which is sort of like sociology, and then another book by Robert Putman, which is also sociology. And that's the unit one. And then we read um, another book by uh, a journalist who studies teachers around the world. But the second unit then is about, um, we read Carol Dweck, and we read um, people who talk about the psychology of learning, right? So they learn sort of sociology and then psychology. So sure. I don't have too much, yeah. Are they reading, so they're reading the full novel? And no, no, yeah, they read the full novel. So we do, we do yeah. a balance between extensive reading, which they can kind of do on their own and it gets mm -hmm. them into reading. So that would be this girl in translation, which is a young adult novel. Then we pick 
very short passages. They don't read all of Savage and Equality. No, it's a difficult book. We pick certain pa pa passages that these are nonfiction. That's also really important is we, we do a lot of nonfiction at this upper level because that's what they're going to be reading. And again, we take certain passages and it's like massively scaffolded, but it's also like, it's really about, it's not about knowing everything that Jonathan Kozel said. It's really about do you, the main point and can you learn how to extract the information here? So there's a lot of instruction in how to take notes. You know, when they go to college, just be like, take notes on this. But like, how do you take notes? How do you annotate? How do you do that? So we work with really short selections, maybe four or five pages, and then it's very intensive. And then the novel is more for the extensive reading. So I don't have too much time. So I'm gonna kind of summarize actually a little bit here. So what they end up writing about finally is, for the first unit is, there's inequality in outcomes we know for, for students who go to different schools, right? There's massive inequality. So why is that happening? What are the factors that are leading to that? And it could be many. So it's pretty, I mean, I chose this. Kozel's saying it's the funding, you know, Putman is saying it's the social norms and, and the community, and Amanda Ripley saying it's the teachers. Of course, it's a mix of different things. But so they're going through and they're summarizing each argument, right? As they were doing these summaries and what's the evidence. Then at the end, they write this paper saying, okay, compare the, how they explain the problem, you know, and which one do you think is doing the best job of explaining it, right? So that's the, that's the final, final assignment, right? So they're gonna discuss factors that the author says is most important for explaining why they're different and you're gonna discuss the evidence. But in a normal class, they would just get this, right? They'd be reading and they would just get this. But what we do is we start them sort of writing this paper by taking notes and summarizing and discussing a lot these issues. So by the time they're writing it, they've already figured this out really. And it's just about putting it in, in the right structure. So just to show you then what we do, we really want students to like, when you're reading something, you need the context. And a lot of times students just dive in and read something. It's like, just, you know, we say, read about Jonathan Kozel. Who is he? What's his point? What is he? And once you know where he's coming from, then it's gonna be a lot easier to understand the specific things he's saying, right? So one of the things is that we really push is, read a little bit about the book and the author before you read it, right? And so this is something that's kind of obvious, but that some of our students don't do. So that's one of the things we train them to do. Then when we're taking notes, what we do is we get them to do kind of a Cornell note sort of abbreviated version. It's like underline some information and then tell me what question does that answer, right? Because that's what you have to do in a research paper. You have a question and then you got to find the information. And then by putting the question here on the right, instead of putting just the answer, this is a great way to study. You read your questions on the side and then you try to remember. So we're constantly teaching them these skills, but always about the same content because that makes it easier to learn the skills. They don't have to relearn a whole new context every time, right? So um, then we teach them ways to organize their information. So the paper is gonna be about which factors um, lead people to have better or worse educational outcomes. So they're reading sort of from Putman's book, they're reading about these two different Latino families and he's comparing them. And then it's a lot of information. And so what we do is say, okay, what, what's the well income of these, this person's family? And how does that, how do you think that influences their education? So there's a lot of thinking before the writing. And that's, I would say is super important. I think they need to learn the forms, but if you, if you don't do the thinking before you're writing, you're not gonna do well in college. You're just gonna have these formulas and you need to have structure, but you need to have structure in your thinking too, right? So we do a lot of that. And that's another example of that. Then we also give them these chunks that we can use when, you know, later in college too, because they don't know this language, you know? So as evidence for his statement that Kozel use statistics about, he points out that, you know, so we're trying to give them these chunks so that they, they have something they can use to express their ideas. And I think those are really important. You just got to make sure that they're thinking at the same time. 
because <laughs> sometimes I've given people chunks and then they're, it's not doesn't make any sense what they're putting in there. But these are really helpful tools, these chunks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we do, we integrate the grammar into um, the content. So this is for actually from a curriculum about nutrition and processed foods. And it's talking about reported speech and it's sort of showing it in that context with those sentences. Um, you know, like she said that she could cook. And then what they do is they go back to, and they take the, te the sentences from Chu on this, which is the guy who wrote Super Size Me. This is a, about McDonald's and their fourth. So they take actual sentences from this book and then they use that reported speech on that. And then later they write about that. So the whole idea is to, to create an assignment that's similar to what they're doing in college, but we just take a long time to go through it and we break it down into each step. And then we teach the grammar and vocabulary that they need all the while making sure that they're actually um, representing the content correctly. But it's what they're gonna do in college. They're gonna be writing about content. They're gonna be writing about what they read. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my that's my my presentation there. Um, as far as Clip versus CUNY Start, I mean the, the the difference really is that Clip is you know for students who whose whose first language is not English, um, mm -hmm. but it's not only that. Sometimes when people come from an I mean it's not just their linguistic abilities that that are important that we address. A lot of them. Um, don't have the background knowledge that yeah. American students have. So a lot of our curricula are explicitly about that. Like they're not aware of inequality, believe it or not, they're not that aware of inequality in America when they come here. So, and then their professors are talking all about this. So we make sure that our curricula include the type of background knowledge that someone who went to high school here would have. So that's that's another, another, uh, mm -hmm. another point that we focus on. And then, then I'll let you know, um, Hillary and, and Nicole will talk a little bit more about, you know, mm -hmm. deciding which where which students should go. So, so Christopher, that was great. That was really great. <laughs> so, um, I'm not going to take questions now, so that there's time for the CUNY Start part. But if people have questions, type them into the chat, and you know we'll get Christopher to answer. We'll do questions uh, later. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm, I actually have a meeting at 3.30. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions. So I'm gonna put my email. Oh, that's great. And then any questions you have, um, I do need to leave at 3.30 because I have a meeting with my supervisor. So, but um, but yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have and, and even set up a Zoom if you wanna talk in more detail. That'd be great. Um, okay, so, uh, Hillary and Nicole, take it away. You're muted, Hillary. Uh, very loud up there. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Christopher. That was so um, useful. And I, so much of what you said has been our experience, too, with our students going into credit classes. Um, so, I'm Hilary Sedaris and Nicole Tavares and I are PD for reading and writing and CUNY START. Um, we're, I'm gonna just um, share my screen. I know I know some of you, I remember your names from, because we were in literacy, we were in the literacy world. So hello to everybody that I met there and maybe Nicole too. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, I mean, I, I also worked in ESL so. Um, or CUNY start. Mm -hmm. So let me share my screen. Sorry for the slowness. Oh, very, it's very slow today. Okay. 
So here are our emails and we can also um, share this, share this uh, bunch of slides with you. Right. Can everybody see this okay? I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's good, Hillary. All right. So um, just to let you give you a little preview, we're gonna talk about some typical assignments in CUNY START. We're gonna show you a, a sample prompt for an analysis paper that a student wrote um, when, when moving from the first unit to the second unit of our semester. Um, we're also gonna show you the student's response. You probably saw, I hope you were able to open the Google Doc with the student's writing. Um, and we'll also share our grade plan and what, um, what the student's reflections and advice were for um, other students when she, right after she left. CUNY start. So um, this is the next couple slides are what Antoinette had to say to other students about her experience in CUNY start. She, um, she was a student with an HSE diploma. Um, she was not a second language student. She's from the Caribbean. Um, she was uh, very, very nervous about studying online, did not know how to use the technology, um, and generally had, had issues with anxiety. So um, it's very nice to see that she wrote about, this was her first time attending college, She's this, she, that she's now a first generation college student. She's now, in, is actually now in her first, finishing up her first semester in college. Um, she says CUNY start is like appetizers before the main course. Um, and then she also talks about, oh, here's where she talks about um, how nervous she was to be studying online. She really did not want to be studying online at all. Um, but she learned to use Google Docs. She learned to use uh, Blackboard. She did all of her, she went to tutoring regularly. Of course, that was online. Um, she, we do a lot of practices with responding to texts that are like CUNY, um, so like Cat W articles, um, and we also have our own reading exam that we've created, which is responding to mm -hmm. memoir pieces in short answers and um, sentences and paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I was going to tell you about internet. Um, she did have a lot of struggles. She was sick a lot. She has a chronic illness. People in her family died during this time that she was in CUNY start. So she bet she was just extremely motivated. Okay, I can mm -hmm. show you our grade plan mm -hmm. and we will take it away. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our curriculum and how we assess students. Again, this is just a taste um, of what we do. We can, well, you know, we'll show our emails again at the end so you can always contact us for more information. Um, but as Hillary just mentioned, um, well, so this is our, our final grade plans for reading and writing. Um, students, um, it's a combined class, but students receive a separate reading grade and a separate writing grade. And in the past, um, as you know, uh, passing the course was completely determined, um, you know, how they did on the final exam. So the Accuplacer for reading and, and then the Cat W for writing. Um, so a couple years ago, we moved to multiple measures. Um, we still have final exams, but they are now um, just 35% of the uh, grade. Um, so you can see in reading, um, we have that final reading assessment that Hillary just described. Um, I, I really resonated with you were, what you were talking about, Christopher, about the idea of short answers as one of our goals um, in thinking about, um, you know, what type, you know, how do you test reading in a writing, you know, in writing? <laughs> um, so we tried to move it away from something that looked like a longer essay. And it's really about the questions move from comprehension to looking at sort of language use or author's tone, and then also some interpretation questions. But the, we have a rubric for it and the grading is really based on, you know, how well they read, you know, how much do they grasp of this memoir piece and less on the 
writing. Of course, you know, the better writer you are, it's, you know, <laughs> you're going to be able, it's hard to, you know, it's not completely separate, of course, but, um, you know, the goal is this idea of being able to answer questions in that short answer form, which we know that they're going to be doing a lot of. Um, and as Hillary mentioned, that 35% in writing is this, um, it says Cat W here, but we were doing the, you know, Cat W up until the move to remote. Um, you know, our new final, as you know, Hillary said, it's very similar to the previous Cat W, but we make our own prompts. They're longer than the ones that the university was giving. Um, and we're trying to make them, you know, interesting topics, a lot of kind of current events. Um, you know, we, you know, things that could be something like Zoom fatigue or, you know, we, you know, Hillary created a great prompt about marijuana legalization, which students have a lot to say about. Um, but, you know, so that, that's there. Um, and then just looking also at the grade plan. Um, so you can see for both reading and writing, half of the grade is looking at skills mastery. And um, that's really the work that they're doing in class, you know, whether quizzes or, you know, looking at how they respond to text. Um, and then you see that there's a final analysis paper. It's actually the same final analysis paper. It's just, we grade it for reading and we grade it for writing. Um, and we have um, a rubric for that. Um, so Hiller's gonna be showing um, a little bit later, not the this final analysis paper, because this is the one that comes at the end of the course, but we also have a, some teachers give a shorter paper that earlier in the semester that kind of prepares them for the final paper. Um, and then also of note, we have, um, we do, grade them on participation and work habits. Um, so we do know that participation is a part of um, the grades, the grades in most credit classes that so we're getting them prepared for that. But participation, it's not only just, you know, raising your hand and talking in class, it could be in the online environment, you know, how you're participating in chat or discussion boards on um, in Blackboard. So, you know, there's various ways that we count participation um, in class. Um, yeah. Oh, before we move to the next slide, I can also say that um, just as an FYI, we have at a couple of campuses, we've, uh, we're, we've moved to a single grade. So we actually have an English grade um, at CSI and at QCC. Um, and that was based on kind of agreement, uh, just work that we did in working with the English departments um, at the campuses and just how they end up placing students in the sequence of courses. It just made more sense for us to have a combined English grade there. Um, and both of those campuses have taken different approaches to a combined grade. At CSI, it looks a little bit more like a combination of these two different grade plans. Um, but at Queensboro, they use a, a portfolio, actually it's a portfolio based um, um, program. We, again, if you have questions about that, we could give you more information about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the first uh, part of our course is something called language and thinking, or we just call it LNT. Um, we there are two main aims for that course. Um, one, as you see here, it's really helping students build metacognitive awareness um, of themselves as readers or writers. Um, we really want them to start identifying what types of reading and writing skills they are using. I mean, I think they often come into our program thinking, I failed, I, I am in this class, and I was, I must, you know, I don't know anything. <laughs> so we want to tell them, no, yes, you, you do already have some reading and writing skills that, and strategies um, that you're using to make sense of text um, that, you know, you're using, but we want you to actually bring them to the surface because I think a lot of it is invisible to our students. So they do that. Um, one way that we help them become more aware is through metacognitive logs. So as they're reading text, we have them respond to some prompts that, you know, we'll ask them to sort of, you know, just make note of what is it that they're doing um, as they're reading. It might be taking note of, oh, I encountered these words I didn't know this is what I did, you know, I looked them up, I figured them out in context, I reread, you know, just kind of what is it that they did um, when they were reading. And then the teachers in response, you know, um, in terms of giving feedback will sort of help them build on those skills and say, oh, that's great. How about you try this skill? Then maybe they'll suggest another type of strategy. Um, and so we, we really hope with this metacog, we build on this metacognitive work, you know, throughout the semester and we you know hope as you know they go on they really start seeing the skills that they've acquired and things that they still need to work on um, 
They're also during L, um, language and thinking, they're also just starting on some really important skills that, um, such as learning how to annotate, um, answer, ask and answer text-based questions, choosing quotations from a text, you know, you know, whether they're going to paraphrase those quotations or analyze them and making personal connections. Um, and kind of thinking about what you were talking about, Christopher, we do start our course um, with some personal writing, but it's, it's in either connection to the text that they're reading or in connection to their own selves as readers and writers or as college students. So it's kind of a very guided, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, personal type of writing. And the focus of that is more in the first few weeks and a little bit less later on. Um, and then we're also in this language and thinking period, we're also, you know, helping them learn how to summarize, you know, identifying themes, supporting interpretations, there might be some comparison contrast work. Um, the, I should say that this part of the course, they're reading um, memoir primarily, maybe something creative nonfiction or personal essay, you know, things that fall into that, that genre. Um, and the theme, um, we're really, you know, helping, most of the texts are looking are written by authors who themselves struggled with reading and writing. Um, so they're kind of looking at, you know, was it that they did to sort of, you know, overcome their obstacles um, and their challenges, you know, also might be connected to um, racism, immigration, um, you know, educational access, poverty. Um, you know, so there's like that identity piece is also part of it as well. Um, so the, again, students are making personal connections and we really want them to see themselves in in this work, in, in these texts. Um, next slide. So um, at the end of language and thinking, um, we conclude that period with a set of um, student conferences um, and also, so student conferences, the students meet with their teachers. If they're in a full-time program, they may meet with a math teacher as well as their reading and writing teacher and they and also will meet with their advisor. And this is a time to kind of reflect on the progress that they've made, um, you know, over the first four weeks, you know, where are they? What is it that they've learned? Where is it that they are hoping to go? Where, where are some areas that they, you know, might have um, struggled? And, you know, together, the team will brainstorm with the student, um, you know, if there were some challenges, you know, ways that they can, you know, the student can kind of move forward um, in the program. And there's also, um, which I'll show in a moment, there's that LNT period also often ends with the culminating project. Um, so after, after language and thinking, after these conferences, we move into the second unit. Um, at most campuses, it's called Coming of Age, which is a short story um, unit. Um, we do have, this is the original curriculum for CUNY START. Some campuses have um, swapped out the Coming of Age curriculum and they do something different. Um, we have a number of teachers do an introduction to psychology. So we want them to get um, a taste of, you know, that sort of content-based um, you know, <laughs> exploration of, you know, um, working through, you know, these continuing to build their skills, but through content. Um, and then we have um, at another campus, a civics and sort of history um, curriculum, which is also really popular. Um, students look at different movements um, such as um, black power, immigration, um, sanctuary movement. So, but you know, they're kind of working on um, the same types of skills um, that students are doing in the coming of age unit. And we also have another exciting curriculum at another campus that's around medical ethics and social justice. Um, but everyone starts out with the same LNT, the memoir piece, and then, you know, they move into the second part. Um, but, you know, so for coming of age um, or for these other curricula, the skills that they're working on is, um, you know, continuing with annotation, but having it become more genre appropriate. appropriate. Um, so in literature, that would be kind of moving beyond just sort of tracking the plot to really looking at um, how narrators, narrators and characters change. Um, they're really, you know, asking and answering test-based questions, you know, moving to, you know, creating response paragraphs. Um, they're really, you know, they're building towards you know, how can I interpret what's going on and find evidence support my interpretations, you know, through, you know, quotations and um, paraphrasing and, and such. 
And then we're really helping them also to read across the text so they can you know, develop and support an interpretation, you know, kind of what, you know, what are the themes that this story is addressing? Um, and those are, you know, that's what they're going to be building towards and when they write their final analysis paper. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going over this very quickly. There's a lot more <laughs> details, but just to give you a sense. Um, next slide. Okay, so kind of going back a little bit. So the, again, the first um, unit is that L and T. Um, so the culminating project, so wanted to give you some examples of what they do. So we, you know, we really see this project as a way for students to you know, consolidate their skills. Um, so, and again, they can see their progress. So some examples of what they might do at the end of the language and thinking pro, um, um, unit is they might write a reflection on what they've done or learned in class. Um, some teachers have students create a portfolio of work that they've done um, and then also include a reflection. Um, again, we're really trying to, you know, <laughs> focus on that building meta of metacognitive awareness. Um, and then other, in other classes, students um, are writing a short analysis paper, um, a lower demand version of the analysis paper that they will do later at the end of the semester. Um, you know, that paper could be a comparison contrast between two texts, um, but it may also just be focusing in on one of the texts that they read. Um, and some teachers will have students, they'll be, you know, the students can incorporate a little bit of their own story, but again, it's that personal retelling is, you know, in, in, in conversation with the authors that they've read. So they still will have to kind of do things like referencing specific um, quotes and places and, and what they read. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then Hillary is gonna take you to um, looking at the specific paper assignment that Thanks, Nicole. Um, so this is this is the um, analysis paper at the end of that first unit, L and T. And this is one particular teacher's assignment. Um, she wanted her students to compare and contrast um, two authors and two essays. Well, I guess First Muse by Julia Alvarez is. Um, part of a memoir called, from a book called Something to Declare, I believe it is. And um, then the Roxane Gay um, is an essay, a personal essay that she wrote um, about her experience, some tra a traumatic experience she had as a teenager. So, um, what the, so this teacher is explaining what she wants the students to do, think about the readings critically, offer your own questions and conclusions. So she wanted to compare and contrast, but she didn't specify what exactly she wanted them to compare and contrast because she wanted them to think about it and come up with something that would be interesting for them to find a theme that would be something that they really wanted to explore. Um, so they had read these, both of these pieces in the class. They had discussed them and written about them. Um, and as far as focusing on the theme, um, the teacher, I mean, generally teachers who do this will, will make sure that students get a chance to kind of brainstorm with each other, with the teacher about some possible themes that they could write about. Um, in this case, um, the student wanted to write about obstacles that both of the um, authors faced, how they overcame the obstacles and how they used characters in, in the books they were reading to inspire them. Um, but so as you can see, the, the teacher is saying, you know, feel free to dig into other issues that come up, um, but explore how the theme that you're interested in is, is present in the two readings. Um, let me just make sure. Yeah, and also I wanted to say, it's that we do a little bit of um, some basic MLA formatting and and introducing what the format of an essay looks like. And that's been even more so since we've been online. So some basic citing and, and formatting. Um, I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the essay um, that's, that's in the Google Doc that we shared, mm -hmm. um, but this, this is basically, you know, the next three slides are from that essay. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the student um, because 
we have a position in our program called writing assistant, which is not the teacher of the course, but a, sort of like a tutor who supports the teacher in responding to papers and um, when we were in person, you know, working with small groups and doing tutoring. So um, we had a little bit of a shortage of, of uh, writing assistant time. So um, I was working with this student online last semester. Um, and these are her first two paragraphs and what you see in the box, in the yellow box are, are my questions to help her keep going. This is a first draft and I just wanted her to add, add as much as she could um, about how those characters help the authors, how the characters in the books that they loved help them overcome obstacles in their lives. So asking more questions about those characters, what, what books they were in, what did they do in the books, and then how did they help the authors um, face their trauma or their ordeal. Um, I don't think we're gonna have time, a whole lot of time to, to look at the essay, but if you do have it, um, we'll just quickly go through these and then maybe we can take a look at the essay if there's still time. Um, so here's, Antoinette's writing about um, Alvarez reading The Thousand and One Nights. Scheherazade is the character who gives her strength, inspires her, and she's, she's attempting to say, write what, what Scheherazade did in the story that kept the Sultan from killing more women. Um, this is the, this is her, Conclude, conclusion, um, it's all one paragraph. It shouldn't be divided by this. It's just so that the, so that the comment can sit there. Um, and just some, just some clarifying questions here about this conclusion, which hasn't really been developed because there needs, there needs to be a lot more put into the, into the first draft before she can really draw a conclusion, but just, just to clarify what she actually means um, when she says, uh, the others find comfort in a motive and just, just sort of focusing on the language there. Um, so I'll stop sharing. And if you, what do you think, Kate? Do we have any, do we have time? Well, what do people want to do? Would you rather be able to ask questions or would you rather go into oh. breakout groups and talk more about the essay that we were sharing? I guess it's hard with three minutes. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I really regret that I only scheduled an hour for this because it's so full of really good information, really rich information. Um, and I thank all of you for giving us that. There's sort of a lot to think about. Um, I definitely can see uh, from your comments, Hillary, that it seems to be about elaborate with guidance, like the um, some of the the student doesn't quite understand, which I think we see a lot. I don't. I want my other folks on the literacy side to weigh in. You know, students not elaborating, or if you you can't just say write more because they don't know what they're <laughs> supposed to you know write about. Uh, mm -hmm. What, the, what exactly their job is there, they don't mm -hmm. quite understand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, I think, so is that kind of coaching a thing that usually happens in CUNY Start and does it happen in CLIP as well? Yeah, that's their whole basis in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely we use a lot of questioning. Um, so the questioning we think is a good way of guidance guiding that you're not answering right you're not and you're, you're asking questions that's a really great thing to do and sometimes you know we did a, a, a session where between drafts the student has to actually answer those questions separately and then hand them to the teacher and then integrate them because sometimes you know you've asked these questions like <laughs> one two three now let me see it on another piece of paper and put it in there so i can really focus so mm -hmm. 
then it becomes like a dialogue because it is sometimes hard to craft. I think that question you use really that you know just ask the questions to get this mm -hmm. go yeah. further, mm -hmm. and then they start to ask those questions themselves. So. Yeah, yeah. When we were in person, you know, we dedicated time in class, you know, teachers are handing out papers with all of those comments exactly as Christopher described with all these questions and where certain, you know, the teacher and writing assistant are circulating and really, you know, talking to the students and conferencing with them as they're reading the questions and making sure, you know, they are really, you know, cause that's the whole task in itself, making sense of these questions and comments yeah. um, and, and having time for them to revise in class while we are there um to provide some assistance to continue to coach them that was you know their benefit of having so many hours you know with the students you know, we can do that so hillary i have a follow-up question too one is so did antoinette was she able to profit from your comments and, and sort of add in that information yeah, I'm, one thing I noticed, what I learned is that when I wrote the comments in the Google Doc on the side and highlighted an area, that was really, um, that she had trouble with that. I, she had trouble identifying where the comments went in the Google Doc, you know, what they matched up to. So that's why I started just writing it into, into the, you know, body itself. Um, it really was effective when it was just like getting her to generate more, just to say more about that or, spe you know, specify what the situation was, how did this happen, and, you know, briefly summarize it. And then um, that part was, it worked really well. Sometimes she really, I think, got overwhelmed by the question and, and just had anxiety. And, and then we would just like have to talk about it, just sort of talk through it. It didn't so so it depended on sort of the level of the question. And do you feel like she developed some metacognitive awareness about like, oh, if I'm going, I can't just mention it. I have to say what trauma Roxanne Gay went through. Do you think she developed some awareness of that? Yeah, I do, and I think she she did also develop an awareness of like what does it mean to introduce a quote and why do you do that? And then like, what do you say after it instead of just repeating what the quote says? Like, it's, she's still struggling with it because I'm still, you know, I'm still working with her and she's in, she's in 101 now and she's still struggling with that. You know, how do you choose the best quote for this? And then what do you say about it that's, you know, that's interesting. Um, but uh, another thing was about voice. Like she really, she has a voice, you know, you saw that in, in her tips and, she has a, 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 she wants to express herself, you know, she wants to say her opinion and she, that was something she had to like kind of learn in 101, the professor was saying, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to, I don't want you to write in the first person at all. Mm -hmm. um, right. Although later when she did her final exam, there was a part one and a part two and the part one was still all third person, but in the second part, she could say, now, what do you think about this? So. As you know, Christopher was saying, like there were ways that um, different genres get blended together and rules get thrown out. Yeah. So that's a big difference because that's a variety of forms and understanding what's expected for each form. Whereas we have like two types of essays that students have to write, and it can be kind of drilling until they get that. Um, but I want to let uh, so David said, how does this type of scaffolding allow room for the students' independent thoughts? And Kristen said, how much? Oh, um, so Kristen, your question was first. So maybe how many drafts? Uh, so I think she's asking you guys how many drafts. Uh, I think we went, for me, with, with um, Antoinette, we usually went through like three drafts. I don't know. I, I think in CLIP, that was also very common for students to do three drafts and actually used to staple them all together in the old days. And David, you had a question? Yeah, you said it. Yeah. How does this type of scaffolding allow room for the students' independent thoughts? Um, I think, you know, in the 
Well, I don't know, I should let Nicole talk too, but I, in the past we used to do much more of the kind of template-y, um, you know, sort of, sort of like what Christopher was showing where you have a, you fill in the blanks, but you have this sort of structure for a sentence. And we found that that actually it doesn't work so well for native speakers who are developing their skills because they already have structures that they're, you know, they don't really need the sentence structure of English. They they have something that they that they bring to it, and it just confuses them to put it into those blanks. Um, but I think if you, their questions are still open ended, and they can put they can they can create the sentences themselves, then it does allow them to express not only their their views but also their you know in their voice. Mm -hmm. I, should, I should let. Nicole. Yeah, all I was going to add to that, um, the writing final, so the version of the, our version of the Cat W that they're doing, um, you know, they, they do have to summarize the ideas of the text and, you know, identify if the author's making an argument or the study is proving something, they do have to discuss that. Um, but we, you know, do um, leave room for them to really analyze, you know, what they've read and, you know, they can offer their opinion, you know, um, kind of like the original Cat W task, you know, where they're able to draw on personal experience or other things that they've read or learned to, you know, it's not always necessarily to say, because they're not always, their personal experience may not always exactly match <laughs> what they're read, but we, we, we encourage them to sort of imagine, you know, being in that situation or um, ask questions, um, you know, I, so there is room for them to analyze and kind of add in their own thoughts to it, you know, the critical response um, piece is really important in that and then, you know, for our program in general. So even if we're removing, you know, in some like the, the analysis paper, we don't, they're not using the I, it's in third person, but um, I still think it's like their ideas are in there, you know, especially when they're interpreting literature, you know, there's, their papers are going to be different, you know, there can be multiple interpretations that are valid as long as they can support it you know well then that's great that's we're really looking for the support part and they do things like you know we have them do debates in class on an issue and current event you know they have opportunities to you know kind of talk about you know what they believe but the the focus is on the supporting with evidence part <laughs> So does anyone else want to ask a question? We're going to have to wrap up in like five, but um, I don't know. Can you guys stay for another five? Um, anyone else want to ask a question? Um, Lester, it's interesting because I feel like you do a lot of the, oh, there is a question. Sorry, Kristen. Uh, so Kristen says, what is the current Cat W like? How is it different from the old one? Um, well, the, the CAT W um, doesn't exist <laughs> anymore. Um, it's, the CAT W for us, is, it's on hold. Um, it used to be, um, well, it was, as Nicole yeah. described it, something from popular culture or, or a topic that many people mm -hmm. know something about, like should families have dinner together or should, should children be... Um, should children, do children have too much screen time? Should their parents limit their screen time? And then there would be uh, a very much abridged article. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that we've been creating, we think are like not so abridged that it's hard to understand them. Um, and they're just slightly longer and they're on issues that we think are more relevant to their lives. Mm -hmm. So we've you know, we're glad we've had that freedom. We don't know if that will end because we don't know. Yeah, what's we don't, yeah. I'm not sure if that's exactly what the question is. No, I, I didn't really. So you're saying that system wide, there is no. Problem. There's, yeah, because it was an in person test, you know, at a testing center mm -hmm. at the campus. So that, you know, has been suspended, you know, since we went remote. So do you but, think Will they go back to that? We, yeah, we don't know. The fall, we've been told um, no, that we will still do our own exams, but I, we, we don't know about the spring. Mm -hmm. so. okay. um, anyone else questions?
Uh, do you feel like they'll have to do a lot of Cat W type assignments in college? Summarize and respond. Uh, Response, I, mean, I think yes is always going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they really, you know, the idea of identifying the the author's argument or what is the you know significant idea. I think that is critical to any. Um, college assignment. I, I, you know, I think this, it does have that funny mix of where you can talk about a personal experience and then the summarizing. Um, and I thought maybe that was a very unique type of assignment, but um, I once when I, years ago when I taught at um, Kingsborough, I did see in a psychology class, an intro to psychology class, uh, an assignment that reminded me in some ways of the Cat W. It did sort of have a combination of, you know, talk about this theory that you read in your textbook and then provide an example you know, from your own life that demonstrates the theory, which is kind of what our psychology curriculum does. So I do think those type of assignments exist kind of, but. Yeah, I mean, you've given me a lot to think about. There's mm -hmm. a lot here to really think about and to think about uh, what little piece on the bottom makes sense for us to maybe work with our students, you know, with. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is how fluent they have to be as writers and readers to do this kind of work, especially when Christopher was talking about how it's all about content. You have to answer these complicated questions about the content. So you can't be really struggling with the writing as well, you know. Um, so, really a lot to think about here. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that we can have you back. Someday. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to show you some examples, maybe of, of our writing final, we can show you some, the range of papers that we see, we see, a, you know, like with you, we see a range of student abilities and levels and kind of, we can kind of show. Yeah, it would, it like. would be nice to then work yeah. towards what could we do with our students. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, to help prepare them a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, um, are you willing to share your slides with the group? Um, yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. I will share them with the whole group. This has been recorded. Um, and if you want to have a, a copy, I will send you a copy of the recording. Um, I'll send it to everybody or post it somewhere if it's too long, if the memory's too long. Now we're getting into things I don't know about, but, um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much. Really rich, really, really helpful. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. It was nice. Yeah. Love to come back. And do mm -hmm. more. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.